shall not be moved. The union is behind us. We shall not be moved just like a tree that's standing by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree. fight together we shall not be moved we will stand and fight together we shall not be moved just like a tree that's standing by the water Black and white together, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's standing by the water. We shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved. We shall not, we shall not be moved just like a tree that's standing by the water. Yes. Hello, comrades. Welcome to class three. Sorry, let me just do. Yeah, do I? How do I? I got you. Ready? Yeah, sorry. It's okay. I'm going to share screen first, and then once we're in there, then we could go to present to you. Oh, wait. No. All right. Is that good now? Okay. Mm -hmm. Great. Thank you. I am, uh, despite what my parents think, I'm terrible with technology. Um, so thank you all for bearing with me. Um, but uh, yeah, no, I'm glad everyone was enjoying We Shall Not Be Moved. Uh, people in here were singing along and I'm assuming people uh, watching were also singing along. It's a classic union song, um, comes from, originally from a, a black spiritual, I shall not be moved, but then it became, we shall not be moved. It was very popular um, on the CIO picket lines and actions in the thirties um, in the black led and integrated unions. Um, and it's been popular in all sorts of movements. Uh, it's well adapted. So it's uh, gonna live a long life. Um, but yeah, today we are going to be talking about um, Oh, Saidi, sorry, could you turn down the sound in here just a little bit? Because I hear myself. Hello. Okay, thank you. That's a little better. Um, sorry, everyone. <laughs> um, so the first two classes, we've been talking about Marxism. We've been talking about revolutions. We've been talking about history um, of communist union organizing, but we haven't really talked about how to uh, form a union. And I know that a number of people said that they wanted to take this class because they wanted an overview of, of the skills of how to unionize. Hello! Um, and a number of you are uh, thinking about unionizing your workplaces. Um, you know, and we've, we've seen this in the last few years with the resurgence of socialism um, and trade union consciousness that a lot of people are just curious about how, how you, the nuts and bolts and basics of forming a union, um, because a lot of people don't know because union density is lower than it's been in a hundred years, you know, since the, basically since the twenties, you know, we're back at a, we're back at a point where we're, where we were at a hundred years ago in terms of density. Um, so people don't learn from their experience like they might, uh, you know, even 30 years ago. 
So people are like, how do you do this thing? So I wanted to address uh, some of that, um, but also still from a communist uh, point of view. So let's hope this video works. How do you form a union? Oh, well, Sadie, wait, maybe now turn the volume up. Share. Share screen, share sound. Buffalo, Buffalo, were you talking about the Starbucks in Buffalo, New York, the unionized? Something you have the right to do that could allow you to negotiate for better pay, more paid holidays, family leave, make it so you can't just get fired for no reason, mm -hmm. medical benefits, fix the leaky ceiling, get rid of that wild dog. I don't know, he's kind of cute. <laughs> so you weren't talking about unions? Don't lie. I'm here from corporate to say, even though unionizing is not that complicated a process, only being like four steps, don't do, do it. it. If you join a union, you gotta pay dues. You don't need a third party coming in here. There's already three of us. You're not happy, we'll change. Uh, what are those four steps? Oh, you wanna know so you don't accidentally unionize. First, you get 30% of your fellow non-supervisory workers to get to sign these little union cards that say you want to vote about joining a union. Second, you Google like whatever industry you're in and then the word union. One of these search result unions will help you out. On their website, there'll be like a little button that says, hey, let's organize. Step three, mail those union cards I threw at you to the NLRB. Step four, the NLRB sets up a little election. And if more than half of you vote, yeah, I want to join a union, you're unionized. And your unit doesn't have to be huge. I mean, like one of those Starbucks in Buffalo is only like 20 people. Anyway, I got to go. Hey, what's all the noise going on? Hey, hey boss, can we have health care? Uh, and can you get rid of that dog? Mm, mm, no. Yeah, okay. Hello? Hello? Can you hear me? Can you hear me online? The thumbs up, it's because you can hear me online, right? Yeah. Yeah. All right. Cool. Thank you. Okay. Uh, whew, I apologize uh, to everyone for the tech difficulties. Um, Saidi, how do I get back to be able to just go next on the slides? Because right now I think I'm looking at the Zoom. I just want to make sure. Oh, wait, no, I got it. Okay. Great, thank you. So, uh, yeah, that's one of the fun things about uh, organizing and life is that uh, technology like comes and gives you fun surprises. Uh, so, um, yeah, but forming a union, is it that simple? Um, you know, that video talked about four steps uh, to unionize to sort of, make it specific on, on how to do it. And it is true. I mean, the first thing is you have to form a committee with your coworkers. You have to find other people in your workplace who want to unionize, uh, particularly because under American law, unionization is done location by location. So even if there's a union within a company um, at another shop, in some countries, because that's true, that means that you can just join that union. There's just a union available to join. But that is not the case in the United States. Uh, you have to have a, a hard fought election um, because the rules are, are set by the capitalists uh, against the workers. Um, but yeah, you, you, you form a committee. Uh, that committee, you know, takes on the tasks of systematically talking with other coworkers, um, you submit a petition to the National Labor Relations Board to say that you wanna have an election. If you can show that at least 30% of the people that work there do want to have an election that's mandated by the government, it does happen. And then if 50% plus one uh, of people vote, then you have officially won an NLRB uh, 
recognized union. Um, but that is very simplistic in some ways, um, because as we know, uh, the companies don't follow the law. So a lot of times like you can win and it's, it's uh, it doesn't really mean anything, right? Um, so <clears throat> there are certain rules that we follow under capitalism um, in order to have legally recognized unions here. Uh, but it's important to remember that a union is not the legalistic structure uh, that recognizes the union's existence. Um, a union is a collective of workers, and it is um, the collective power of masses of workers to challenge capital, to shut down production, to win demands, um, to control their own fates democratically. Um, and communists recognize the power of the union as a, as a way for workers to learn to organize um, and learn how to organize their own lives and learn about the uh, interplay of, of production and, and learn uh, really systematic social um, thinking. Uh, and communists also, you know, recognize the potential of a union as a revolutionary vehicle when revolutionary thought and when scientific socialism uh, are fostered within the union. Um, so those four steps, those sort of breakdowns, here's how you form a union. It is that simple, but also it's not that simple. Um, there are no shortcuts to organizing. There is no magic wand. Um, it's a continuous process. So uh, today's lesson um, on unionizing. So first for the theoretical stuff, we're going to look at William Z. Foster again. Um, we looked at him twice in this course for good reason. He was one of the most important union organizers in 20th century uh, US and he helped build uh, the IWW and uh, also the CIO, the principles in building those um, sort of interesting contradictions of uh, how theoretically how to, how to build unions, uh, you know, can be traced through him. And, and then he also helped lead uh, the communist forces and the, and the mass popular forces at, uh, during one of the biggest strike waves, you know, the second biggest strike wave only to the Civil War uh, in US history. So um, he's a good guy to learn from. And also the principles laid out in the CIO organizing methodology are still the ones used by uh, successful militant unions today. Um, and uh, we're going to look at Jane McAlevey's uh, No Shortcuts, Organizing for Power in a New Gilded Age, um, on sort of how that is applied in a, in a union setting. Um, we're going to look a little bit about the obstacles that you'll face while unionizing um, from bosses and their goons. And then we're also going to talk a little bit about salting, um, which is... Uh, you know, what it's called when in, in American labor parlance, uh, when you get a job at a workplace with the purpose of unionizing, um, either on your own or as part of a collective project. Um, and salting is something that has a lot of uh, valuable historical currency, and it's also something that's coming up again in, in the labor movement, um, as a lot of trade unionists are looking to the building of the CIO um, and other times of, of uh, progressive labor unrest, uh, you know, that, le that led to victories. Um, they're seeing the, the importance of, of worker-led action, um, which means 
uh, you know, if you're going to be organizing workers, it's good to to like actually be among them and be and be a worker. So that's a little bit about the salting component. Um, and then uh, we'll go through not really a workshop uh, on uh, union organizing because there won't be the you know role playing and participatory component, but uh, it'll be an introduction to some of the the concepts that I'm sure will be familiar to some of you um, but they're the concepts of uh, the skills of how to unionize the CIO stand for Congress of industrial organizations yes okay I just want to make sure yes the CIO stands for the Congress of industrial organizations so um, yeah they were the uh, progressive and, and left-wing led uh, labor federation uh, of the 30s um, that was very important for building the trade union movement um, and building really all the all the popular and progressive movements in that which was then and was communist led and then was pushed back um, during McCarthyism during the second Red Scare um, you know, there was a forced merger of the AFL and the CIO and uh, communists and lefties were kicked out of most of the unions. Um, and it was a yeah big purge, bad time. Um, and we're still, you know, recovering from it today um, and feeling the effects of it today. Um, but people are remembering the, the importance of these tactics developed um, by the CIO and really looking to study them. And as I said, you know, they've, they've never really gone away, but people are sort of, you know, rediscovering um, the history and really connecting with the history in a, in a new way to inspire uh, the revolutionary trade movements today, uh, especially among millennials and Gen Z. Um, so first up, foster organizing methods in the steel industry. Um, so uh, would someone like to read two of these? Uh, we'll just need the microphone one second. Comrade in the pink. William C. Foster, uh, National Chairman of the Communist Party and Leader, 1990 Social. Uh, from, from page one of the yeah she's she's gonna read and there's also the re yeah yeah so you can read along if you have if if you have the documents you want to read along um but I, but i pulled from various parts so it'll it'll be hard to read along in in the in the document so it's okay we'll just yeah but yeah it's that's the one the organization work must be done by a working combination of the progressive and left-wing forces in the labor movement it is only these elements that have the necessary vision, flexibility, and courage to go forward with such an important project as the organization of the 500,000 steel workers in the face of the powerful opposition of the steel trust and its capitalist allies. The organization campaign must be based upon the principles of trade, of trade union democracy. That is every effort must be made to draw the widest possible ranks of the workers into the activities of the leading decisive communities and also into the work of the organizers and the union generally. Only with such democracy or systemic mass participation can the great task of building the union be successfully accomplished. Uh, and then would someone like to read the next two? Just stand here because I'm not wearing my glasses. That's okay. You stand wherever you need. The campaign must develop a strong discipline among the organizers and workers. The necessary discipline cannot be attained by issuing drastic orders, drastic orders, but must be based upon wide education work among the rank and file and the development of confidence among them in the cause and ultimate victory of the movement. The organization campaign must be a fighting movement. It must realize that if the workers are to be organized, they can only rely upon themselves and the support they get from other workers. While every advantage should be taken of all political institutions and individuals to defend the workers' civil rights and to advance their interests generally, 
it would be the worst folly to rely upon capitalists, politicians to adopt measures to organize the workers. There is every probability that only through a great strike can the workers establish their union and secure their demands. And this perspective must be constantly borne in mind. Thank you, comrades. Um, so there are, you know, seven or so general principles. There's only four of them at the beginning, but, um, you know, these are four that I think are themes that you see throughout Foster's writing on trade unionism time and again. Um, you know, the left wing must do the work, the importance of communists and the left and progressive forces leading the labor movement, not only because they'll have the vision that'll help provide the stamina to do the sort of grueling work, but also because they're the only ones who can inject um, the more militant socialist, um, you know, propaganda at the right moments. Um, to both win the union and also then move it towards a revolutionary prospect. Um, and uh, the idea of trade union democracy, of, of having as many individual workers involved in the, the union uh, as possible instead of just sort of um, an elected bureaucracy. Um, and then the idea that, um, you know, discipline is necessary, but the idea, this sort of really democratic centralist idea that discipline actually doesn't come from the top, that discipline is sort of um, a value that individuals buy in on. And so they think collectively and work militantly and collectively and in a disciplined fashion um, because they choose to do that uh, because they realize the, the bigger picture. So there's um, development of, of rank and file confidence in, in the union that leads to this, um, yeah, uh, democratic centralist um, kind of discipline, but this kind of discipline um, is, is necessary to be victorious sort of under the strain of, of facing the bosses. And then um, you have to be able to strike. Um, you know, this was definitely true. All of the unions are fighting unions back in this day, um, very literally, you know, having battles where they were being killed by the cops. Um, but it's still true today. Like you don't win a contract unless you're able to go out and strike. That's that's still true. So even a, even a weak contract um, is enforced by uh, collective action of, of the unions. And so workers have to understand that. Um, so um, this is a great pamphlet. You should, you should definitely read all of it. Uh, one thing I want to point out is if you look at all of the different sections, it, it really is just how to's of um, things that might be sort of ob obvious, like you should try to reach people through all of these different methods and you should have organizers that, you know, you should have black organizers, you should have immigrant organizers, you should have youth organizers, you should have women organizers to be able to reach all of the different, um, you know, segments of the, of the population. And um, how do you want to relate to the community generally, um, well, you want to for sure, first of all. So it's just a very like meticulous point by point um, how to of, of organizing. Um, and it's, you know, it's very general and, and sort of generalizable, but, uh, but yeah. And then this is a poster um, from the forties from a from a mass meeting cio mass meeting um so i'm going to read a couple of the i'm going to read uh this slide um but these are just from some some general points and i think it get this gets at how uh 
just how relevant this stuff still is like the you know the whole pamphlet is like this where you read it and you're like wow this is very true um still today um steel workers cannot be organized by agitation alone it requires thorough organization work to unionize them the work must be coordinated and planned per organizer per locality per day per week um, so he's saying it has to be very methodical, but then the very next thing, not mechanical blueprint tactics, but flexibility. So you have to be really methodical, but in your method, you know, in this methodical nature, you have to be able to be responsive and not get dogmatic. Um, and how you do this depends on local conditions. Uh, you always want to be drawing members into, um, Decision making because that helps them feel ownership over the union, helps them realize that it is theirs, that it is a democratic body. Um, people don't come to these this participation spontaneously, though they have to be organized into it. Um, organizers do not know how to organize by instinct, but must be carefully taught. And this goes back to uh, you know that Leninist principle of a certain level of consciousness, you can only attain a certain level of consciousness spontaneously. And then beyond that, um, once, you, once you get what's beyond just basic observable reality, um, you, you have to be taught. And so this is true with any, with any scientific um, method, with any craft you know, um, and it's true of organizing. Uh, and then every step taken in the campaign must have as a central purpose, the direct recruitment of new members. The main slogan is join the union. Um, yes, well, microphone, sorry. The um, oh, well, if you could save it then, just because we've already, yeah, just because it's sort of a lot uh, jammed in. So, um, this is another section. Um, so I'm going to read the individual recruitment section, but then um, if someone wants to read the four points below it. So individual recruiting is the base of all immediate organizational work in the steel industry. It is fundamentally important in every steel center and may be the only form for the time being where terroristic conditions prevail. So he's saying um, asking people to join the union might be the only form of union activity you can even do within certain hostile work environments, but it's still, it's still important for expanding the union. Um, in, Elementary aim in the campaign should be to activate the greatest numbers of workers to do this individual buttonhole work. The campaign can only succeed if thousands of workers can be organized to help directly in the enrollment of members. Because he's talking about wanting to organize, how do you organize the entire industry, 500,000? Well, you definitely need thousands of people doing the organizing minimally, right? And that can only be paid staff. It has to be workers themselves talking to each other. Um, this work cannot be done by organizers alone. Their main task is to organize the most active workers among the masses in great numbers to do the recruiting. The tendency common in organization campaigns to leave the signing of new members solely to the organizers and to recruitment and open meetings should be avoided. Um, so this is something you see a lot in unions still today. Uh, this, this tendency of staff organizers doing all the organizing. Um, so does anyone want to read uh, these four uh, methods of recruitment? There's lots of reading today, so everyone will get a turn. So um, the chain system of organization is one of the best means of individual recruitment. By this method, workers undertake personally to organize their friends or to furnish their names so that they can be approached by other organizers. There should be a close checkup kept on all this work. The list system can also be effective in difficult situations. By this method, trusted workers, volunteer organizers, women, etc., get lists upon which to collect the signatures and fees of workers in various organizations. 
Individual recruitment in all its forms should be organized as far as possible according to department and mill. Thorough organizational arrangements should be made for signing up new members at social affairs, radio listening groups, small home meetings, in fraternal lodges, etc. Thank you, comrade. Um, so, yeah, I uh, I just love these four points because it's just literally how you recruit people, and it's still how you do it today. Um, you know, if you ever tried to organize your workplace, you know, you're trying to find other people uh, at the workplace who can take care of talking to people, you know, around them in their department. Um, if you're in a big place where there's a lot of people, you, you try to get lists in some way, uh, either from your work site or from other people who would have the list, you know, like, a, you know, uh, you know, you, you go, you find people at clubs um and you also want to make sure it's it's organized and i just want to point out you know this is just still what we do today so i don't know if people i don't know if this image of the with all the colors uh that's like names that are highlighted with stickers next to them is familiar to anyone um but this is a, a wall chart i want you to imagine you know like four feet wide two feet high um, and it's just literally like a wall chart of names in a department and they're tracking um, different things they've done did they signed a survey did they say they would vote you know all the you know and sort of it tracks how um, sort of involved people are and and uh, whether your department is pro-union or, or all of that um, and it's a form of like list making um, you know, built from the CIO days. And then this is uh, a WhatsApp chat group uh, from uh, Brie Lucilla, who's a, um, a, an ALU organizer, um, West African um, from Liberia. And he was uh, really influential in um, organizing and mobilizing uh, the West Africans to vote uh, yes, in the union elections. So um, one method applied was just a WhatsApp chat, WhatsApp chat group of you know all the West Africans, and uh, you know it's a sort of modern day uh, list making, right? Um, so this um, is some of the CIO stuff applied today. This is from Jane McLevy's book, one of her books. Um, and this is talking about a, a 1199 there in SEIU uh, union, although that history is in mergers a little complicated. But, um, but yeah, would someone like to read this first paragraph online? online? I, I would love folks online. If anyone Milan, online you could wants to read. use the raise hand feature. Luke wants to read. I see Luke. I see you there. <laughs> yeah, I can do. <clears throat> On March twentieth, two thousand one, in Washington State, uh, eleven ninety nine Northeast was launching the largest nursing home strike in U.S. history. The workers, overwhelmingly women of color, voted to walk off the job, even though they already had the highest wage and benefit standards of any nursing home workers in the nation including a substantial pension, a real one, not a 401k, an impressive self-funded health care plan, a robust employer paid training and upgrading fund, a two or three step grievance and arbitration procedure, and more workplace rights than almost any other non-management employee in the United States enjoys today. The strike was a strike for increased staffing. Jerry Brown said the strike muscle is like any other muscle. You have to keep it in good shape or it will atrophy. Since the beginning of the new millennium, Connecticut's nursing home workers have gone on strike every year except 2008 and 2011. By constantly engaging in strikes, 1199 Northeast is con constantly engaging in the hardest of structure tests, that is, tests that measure both union democracy, democracy and the participation levels of the rank and file. Thank you. Um... I don't only pick on people, but we had Eric had raised their hand from online. Oh, amazing. So we could pass it on. Eric, sure. if you're still down. Oh, yeah. Yeah, sure. Hi. <clears throat> Using the word strike early in the organizing process is part of a strategy that pays very careful attention to semantics. 
which are absolutely key to successful organizing. A key question in 1199 for generations has been, are there two sides or three in a workplace fight? Upon learning of a union drive, an employer will usually begin an anti-union campaign by declaring, we don't need a third party in here. By third party, the boss means a union as a third party, with the boss being one party and the workers being a second party. In good organizing and in the 1199 NE approach, a key to victory and to a successful strike vote and strike is that the workers see themselves as the union, in which case there are only two sides, a crushing answer to the employer's message. Thank you. Um, yeah, uh, yeah, that benefits package described in the in the first paragraph, you know, uh, envious, uh, right? It's like there's there's some workers who would think, why would I strike for this? Um, you know, it's especially interesting when you think about when you work in a place that uh, does not have good benefits, you're trying to unionize and you usually use this contrast as a reason to unionize. But then of course, even once you get this, you wanna keep going because it's still not enough, right? Because the whole point is that the bosses um, have stolen our, our money, our profits, right? And so there's, so it's like, there's always this unequal exchange happening uh, and we wanna fight for the full fruits of our labor. So that's why we work towards, towards revolution. Um, that's the ideological thing. But then there's also the practical thing. There's a the practical thing of, especially in a capitalist system, uh, if you let down your guard, the capitalists are gonna take advantage of that. And then your ability to fight you know, gets, worse you have to practice you have to keep fighting and you have to show the boss that you have the ability to fight because they're always looking for a weakness to take back the things that we fought for already so um so the most militant unions strike regularly um and they build up to huge mass strikes and majority strikes where the, the majority of the workers um, are, are striking. And ideally the strike is built through workers themselves um, versus again, the sort of union leadership trying to push it. Ideally it's built from below um, and unions uh, that that foster this or are trying to make that happen. And so that's why they do the, what is termed a structure test, why they do structure tests, which is ways to test systematically to see how powerful your union is. You know, can you work in unison? Um, can you do collective action? And the strike, as it says, is the hardest of structure tests. You build up to it, right? Um, and the way you build up to that is you have to plant the idea. And good organizing is meticulous and well thought out. And this includes thinking about our words and thinking about how our words are perceived. And this is true in labor settings. You know, I mean, you don't want to get Again, you don't want to get dogmatic about it. You don't want to freak yourself out. Like, oh, I used the wrong word. So therefore now the, the union will never form. Like you don't want to over, overthink it, but, um, but semantics are helpful in organizing for sure. And they help people have a, a, a certain level of consciousness. So, um, yeah, this list uh, is a sort of informal cultural thing uh, in 1199, where th this is the core values and, and like, quote unquote, manual. Um, 
that all of the staff organizers go by and it's built from CIO uh, methods and values. Um, I don't know if, if people can read the screen well, but I would love to hear, you know, if people could just tell me like, what's one that sticks out to you like as an organizer that you find really striking? I like reading this list. Workers are made of clay. Wait, remember we have to. So for people to hear, you have to always, always raise your hand for the microphone. Thanks. Uh, workers are are made of clay, not glass. As in, like they're malleable, and um, you know, when when you try to work with them, they're not going to just like break and crumble in your hand. Mm -hmm. That's that's what. That's yeah. nice. Thank you. I like that one too. Comrade over there. Um, I thought the number 10, the working class builds cells for its own defense, identify them and recruit their leaders. I feel like in my workplace, there's there are people who have become really close friends with each other. And that's kind of a way to like get through the day. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And just thinking about that as like a kind of like friendship is a kind of defense yeah. in the workplace. I really like that, that one. It's a beautiful uh, sent, uh, sentiment about how uh yeah oh i i saw to hear you had raised your hand but then you lowered it did you have one or yeah or, yeah i can cool. go ahead yeah um definitely 11 and 12 so anger is there before you are channel it don't diffuse it i think some of the best conversations i've had with tenants that we're organizing is those who uh are very anti the idea of us trying to unionize the building and the neighborhood because they're just so angry um, at the conditions of the apartment, at the rents going up, but it's like the anger is fantastic. It's obviously there already. Uh, and so how do we like bring that anger into the organization and like actually like channeling that anger into power? Yeah, absolutely. Um, NATO? Nato, sorry. Yeah, Nato, thank you. Sorry, Nato. Uh, I was gonna say uh, eleven and twelve, but I guess I uh, said it before me because I uh, I talk a lot with the people at my job, and there's a lot of anger, and mm -hmm. I guess it's kind of like trying to figure out how to channel that anger and to be able to, um, you know, build power and you know fight for better conditions. So it's kind of like. People are angry, but sometimes they don't know what to do and how to orient that anger. You know, so. Yeah, exactly. Um, and I think we all, especially how things are now under late capitalism, you know, we can sort of sense that anger around us. And as organizers, it's, it's yeah, it's tapping into the anger that's already there. Um, there was a comment in the room and then Gerard, a comrade in the tie. Uh, I like number, sorry, I can't even see if my glasses, number 17, communicate to workers that there is no salvation beyond their own power. I really like that um, because I think with career organizers and either um, the tenant context or the labor context, it's very easy to see people as like a third party coming in to kind of like save the building or save the workplace, mm -hmm. but really communicating to people that, yeah, like the union is you and it really is only as effective as, as the amount of um, kind of work and passion that you put into it, I think makes for much more lasting campaigns and institutions. Thank you, absolutely. And uh, Gerard. Hey, thank you. Can you all hear me okay? Um, so yeah, I was going to say 17 as well, uh, just in my particular situation, I think, or in many workplaces, I think a lot mm -hmm. of people feel like uh, upper management, the bosses just really aren't listening to them. And I think what I try to convey to people a lot is that, well, if they want change in the workplace, it's going to have to come from us because a lot of them feel like they're being dismissed. So I think 17 is a good thing to use, especially if the people you're working with feel like they're being dismissed uh, by their employer, especially consistently. Thanks. Absolutely. Yeah, no, thank you. Um, so there's one I want to point out before 
moving on. Oh, oh, so there's someone else. Uh, then maybe maybe they'll get it. Yeah, go ahead, Conrad. Uh, we'll see. Um, I really liked seven and eight together um, because that seems like a pretty practical way of breaking the third uh, union as a third party illusion. That if the boss is saying, we don't need a third party in here. Why, why do we need to bring outside people in to work it out amongst ourselves? If the union is straight up telling you, you guys got to do this. We're here to help. But if you're not doing it, there's nothing we can do. That sort of immediately allows for like the reality that it is propaganda to sit in quick from the start. Um, and so I thought that that was a very, it was very good that they put those two together to not only ask the workers to do it, but then be straight up with them about whether, if they're not actually doing that and are treating you like a third party. Absolutely. Um, thank you. And the, so the one that I want to highlight uh, is number 16. Organizers talk too much. Most of what you say is forgotten. Uh, so I, uh, I think that, you know, a lot of us who are organizers, we, especially when we're Marxists, um, or have a theoretical basis for why we do what we do, just have this tendency of wanting to be able to just explain to people and if you just explain it the right way and you just explain it enough then th th they'll come to the right understanding and they'll listen to you and they'll do it and then everything will be great and if we all just you know so but that's <laughs> um you know and then that also gets out a little bit this thing where w we're all especially as revolutionary organizers like we're driven by that so we talk about it a lot but that's not the kind of thing you are going to be talking about a lot with most workers like most workers even if they and i would contend they do like the idea of, of revolution in some sort of concept like what workers care about first and foremost with the union especially before you've built a revolutionary union is like the economists needs their needs the things they need um and you you don't want to just be talking about these ideals you want to listen and you want to be showing the workers that you're working with that you're listening to them and also listening and observing as skills um are what allow you to better analyze the social conditions because your job as the organizer is to help mold the sort of social organization. And uh, yeah, you just don't talk your way into that. So uh, yeah, and, and workers respect doing, they, they recognize work and they also recognize bullshit. So uh, All right, so we've talked a little bit about some organizing principles and seeing them applied. Um, when organizing, um, we're facing a really fierce enemy. Um, you know, the workplace is not a democracy. Um, the boss is a tyrant um, and he will do like <laughs> we see by how many deaths there are at the workplace every year preventable deaths across all kinds of industries uh, many of us probably work in industries where we can where we know instances of like coworkers or people in our fields like dying on the job because of the working conditions uh, we see very plainly that the boss literally does not care if we live or die. So if they're happy to let us die when we're just doing our jobs, like they do not care if we die in the process of class war to win back the profits that they have stolen from us. It's a very serious business. Um, they will spend absurd amounts of money and time uh, stopping people from 
getting the smallest of wins that don't even that make the smallest of short-term economic uh, concessions into their profits, right? Um, and we need to take this seriously and we need to expect it. And when organizing, we need to plan for it. So union busting, as a tactician, union busting is no excuse for a loss because this is the world we live in. We're very well aware that this is part of it. I mean, you shouldn't beat yourself up for losses. Losses happen, losses are normal. A lot of times in workplace, um, you know, it takes a couple of votes before you win the vote, for example. And, and this is true in all kinds of battles, but still <laughs> we know what the enemy is like. We know what the boss is like. Um, and we just, we have to take, this into consideration. We have to take this seriously. Um, you know, they'll break every law. They'll also use every law. Um, they'll get the government forces to work on their behalf to force people back to work. Um, you know, they'll arrest people both with public police and then also their own private spies. The Pinkertons are alive and well. Uh, if you haven't seen, uh, you know, the the Pinkertons have been part of the recent activity uh, of union busting forces. Um, a, a couple of years ago, they did this like tweet during Pride Month. It was real with like a rainbow, you know, Pinkerton logo. So, you know, that's some fun uh, rainbow washing. Uh, so, yeah. Uh, so, yeah, know your enemy. Um, the, in the U.S. context in particular, the classic thing that companies do is, um, they hire consultants. This is a, a capitalist, uh, country. So we rely upon, you know, the marketplace to, uh, take care of our union busting needs. Uh, so the Confessions of a Union Buster is a book that was written by, um, you know, a former union buster had a come to Jesus moment late in his life and uh, then worked with unions to educate uh, workers on, on the industry and sort of common practices. Um, and it's like slightly dated, but it's still pretty good overall of a read. Um, so yeah, would someone um, like to read uh, half of this slide, either online or in person. Ah, wonderful, thank you, comrade. Um, union busting is a field populated by bullies and built on deceit. A campaign against the union is an assault on individuals and a war on the truth. The only way to bust a union is to lie, distort, manipulate, threaten, and always, always attack. The law does not hamper the process. Rather, it serves to suggest maneuvers and define strategies. Each union prevention campaign, as the wars are called, turns on a combined strategy of disinformation and personal assaults. To fell the sturdiest union supporters in the 1970s, I frequently launched rumors that the targeted worker was gay or was cheating on his wife. It was a very effective technique, particularly in blue collar towns. If even the nasty stories failed to muzzle an effective union proponent, the busters might get to the worker fired. Such was the case of Jeanette Allen, an assembly line worker at the Stant Company Manufacturing Plant outside Little Rock, Arkansas. So someone want to pick it up from there? The Stance factory was torn by the conflict between a vigorous United Auto Workers organizing effort and a dogged counter drive by corporate officers and their consultants. One night, as graveyard shift workers pressed and cut hot metal into the shape of radiator caps, the, plant's foreman, the plant foreman's phone rang. The foreman answered and heard the voice of a black woman announce that there was a bomb in the factory. He then let the crew go on working for nearly an hour before evacuating the plant. The police got a warning call from the same person that night. When they searched the factory, they found nothing, but they had captured the caller's voice on tape. 
Two plant managers identified the caller as Alan. It wasn't a she, a black woman whose intelligence and integrity had earned her the admiration and loyalty of her co-workers. Alan also happened to be an outspoken proponent of the UAW campaign. Company bosses, it seemed, had considered her the driving force behind worker support for the union, particularly among blacks who made up one third of the workforce. They feared her. As soon as Alan was implicated in the bomb threat, she was fired. Meanwhile, her coworkers wondered what kind of union could corrupt such a stalwart character. The UAW lost the election. It was a contemptible plan, but it was a perfect one by the only measure that matters in the war on labor. It worked. Thank you. Um, so, yeah, the only measure that matters in the war on label, it worked. It's about power. It's about winning. And, uh, you know, character assassination is very common. Uh, by union investors about workers. I suggest doing it back. That's a fun thing we've been doing in ALU is we make wanted posters of the union investors that come in and we and we do research um, you know about how much they've made previously and we and we get this information to the workers to inoculate against their effectiveness. Um, you know, only our character assassination is correct and true and accurate and they make up lies. Um, or they do the thing where they find like a like one, a, a kernel of truth and then they, you know, that's the best way to do character assassination, of course, is you find something that's true and then you build this sort of narrative around it to, um, that is false. Um, and then the false things really stick. Um, so, yeah, no, and it gets, it gets pretty gross and nasty. I mean, like, so during the ALU drive, for example, um, one of our organizers, Maddie Wesley, you know, had rumors being spread around about her that, um, you know, uh, that were like basically arising to the level of sexual harassment um, about her and Chris Smalls. And there's there's all kinds of, you know, things that get made up and, and slung around and they get the workers to repeat them and it becomes this game of telephone, um, you know. And uh, yeah, it can, get, it can get pretty nasty. And then there's also just basic like cops being called to arrest people, firing workers for, um, you know, unfair things, speed ups that lead to you not meeting your production numbers, so you get fired. Uh, you know, during the ALU drive, Chris and Brett Daniels and a few other workers were arrested a few different times uh, on the Amazon property. And uh, you got like, current workers at the warehouse were arrested sort of basically uh, before their shift. And, uh, and then, you know, we've, we were seeing Bernie go after Howard Schultz right now for the Starbucks union busting because it's been bad enough that it's getting sort of national attention um, and the movement is, is pressuring actual government intervention. Um, but I just wanted to hear from people who've been involved in, in union drives, if they have any examples of union busting they've experienced, if they want, if they feel comfortable sharing it. Um, and if not, that's totally fine. Okay, hold on, let's just get you the mic. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, in the grand scheme of things, it's very, very minor, um, but um, since we were very much at the beginning of the campaign, it felt like, I think it was the first time that we were encountering some sort of reaction to our organizing. Uh, but um, I had published an open letter in the internal messaging uh, app that we used at our workplace. And uh, the next day I received a call from my manager saying that he had received a call uh, from his manager saying he was very worried about me, uh, that they really did not want to discourage me from 
speaking up uh but uh there's the line and then they they said that i had not crossed the line they did not say that uh i even was approaching the line but there's the line and uh uh, they wanted me to be very mindful of my coworkers, uh, that uh, I should be, uh, you know, keeping them in mind because people might start asking questions about like who I was, what team was I on, what work they were doing and stuff like that. So they did not want me to bring attention to my coworkers in a way that would uh, put them at risk, essentially. So obviously it's bullshit, right? It's like just uh, a way to silence uh, any sort of dissent. So yeah, that was pretty nerve wracking. Yeah, it is. Dr. Pond. Hey, yeah. Um, this uh, this kind of happened a little before my organizing education, so I didn't maybe pick up on it right away, or <clears throat> maybe I approached it not in the best way, but I went around and talked to people in my department, got their concerns by about a third of them, and then I went and talked to my boss uh, individually um, and brought up the concerns. And of course, I was brushed off. Uh, but what happened afterward, and it may have been a coincidence, maybe not, is the boss started setting up one-on-one -on -one meetings with everyone. So to me, that seems like a kind of a tactic, like nothing official, no union drive yet, but starting to go through the department after I had raised concerns and said several other people feel this way, started having individual conversations with everybody and very likely just trying to placate people personally to try to drive down the, any fervor they might have to come together and complain. So that's been my experience. <clears throat> Nothing too egregious, but I can see that maybe moving forward will be a little tricky uh, with this particular boss. Yeah, I think your read is correct. <laughs> um, yeah. Uh, no, I also faced, you know, during the ALU drive leading up to the vote, um, faced write-ups, threats of write-ups. Um, and every, every worker organizer, uh, on the campaign, uh, did, and there's always these coincidental realities that the bosses point to, to explain why it's not, because, uh, you know, a lot of this behavior is illegal. Um, some of it more recently than others, you know, this current NLRB is trying to put into place a lot of laws and norms that haven't been in place in 80 years, which is actually very exciting. Uh, um, but, you, you know, it, 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 right, 80, it's, people don't think about it, but it's like even under the Biden administration, it's been 80 years since the NLRB has tried to put worker forward policies in place, even if they're not always good at enforcing them, you know. Um, but that's a reaction to the worker on unrest. You know, it never happens just from above. There's a, that dialectical, um, you know, back and forth that's happening. Uh, but but anyway, um, uh, you know, they they break the law. <laughs> um, you know to uh, to to union bust um, you know happily and they but they always try to plausibly deny it so they'll always try to find something to explain why what they're doing isn't law breaking um, even when it's even when it's very obvious um, oh yes a comrade in the back So I worked at a hotel. Um, I was actually a salt, but that's for later. Um, yeah. And one of the things that happened, a lot of the housekeeping um, units and all the hotels across Chicago were organizing. And so one of the things that they started doing was cutting the hours of all of our housekeep, all of like the staff housekeepers, quote unquote, and then hiring like outside um, cleaning companies, which were often like very young, undocumented women mm -hmm. um, to pick up the shifts um, because they were cutting the regular housekeeper's hours so that it just like made everyone afraid that they were like gonna lose their jobs or lose, particularly lose their benefits because mm -hmm. they weren't getting enough hours. Um, and they called it like um, 
um, issues with like paying or like they didn't have enough money or like, well, we can't give you all of these hours because it's not fair to everyone else. But it was like very clear that they just didn't want, they wanted the housekeepers to be afraid of organizing because they were going to get their hours slashed even more. So. Yeah. Were you through night here? Yeah. Yeah. Unite here is one of the unions that has kept up uh, salting as a, as a union organizing practice. So it's very, uh, it's good. It's a good thing. Um, and yeah, and that, I think that story points to something we've talked about in previous classes about how, um, you know, the capitalist creates these, these divisions in labor, particularly, you know, uh, immigrant workers, black workers, and um, that's, you know, it makes it, you know, in, in these literal senses, and then sort of ideologically, so then the major unions don't even, aren't even trying to organize the domestic workers or the immigrant workers or the other potential um, strike breakers and, and these kinds of things, scabs, you know, and these divisions have, have really uh, screwed over unions previously when this, when these kinds of divisions aren't taken into account. Um, so yeah, no, that's a, a classic and terrible uh, story. Thank you for, for sharing. And yeah, I've been gone for days, I'm sure if, uh, you know, the union vesting is very common. So now salting I, I, is now, um, so I can't wait to hear from you. Um, but we're gonna uh, read a little bit for uh, folks that aren't as familiar. Um, does someone want to read this slide? Eleanor, thank you. Hello, okay. If you want to unionize a workplace, Will Westlake was saying, get used to unclogging the drains. At a secret off hours gathering held in Rochester, New York in March, the 25 year old former barista told a few dozen labor activists that a great way to build trust with coworkers and bosses is to volunteer for thankless chores. In his case, that meant spending months at a Starbucks outside Buffalo in 2021, getting on his knees and reaching beneath the sinks to yank loose the grimy mix of mocha chips, espresso beans, congealed milk, and rotten fruit that regularly stopped things up. Be the person who's willing, Westlake said. It's going to make the company less suspicious of you. The proof, he told the crowd, came toward the end of 2021 after baristas at his Starbucks and others in the area had filed federal petitions to hold union elections. The practice of joining a workplace with the secret aim of organizing it is called salting, Westlake was addressing recruits at the insider or at the Inside Organizer School, a workshop held a couple times a year by a loose confederation of labor organizers. At these meetups, experienced activists train other attendees in the art of going undercover. Speakers lecture and lead discussions on how to pass employer screenings, forge relationships with coworkers, and process the complicated feelings that can accompany salting. Most salts are volunteers, not paid union officials but unions sometimes fund their housing. Thank you. Thank you so much, Eleanor. Um, yeah, salting. So for those of you that don't know, I was a salt. Um, I was recruited by another salt, uh, Maddie Wesley, uh, who was already involved in the ALU drive to, to join. And I did that. Uh, and uh, something else that, you know, people may not know is that um, the Starbucks victories that we saw in New York um, a year and a half ago were not spontaneous, you know, in the, the Leninist sense. They, um, they were developed as part of an outside plan. Um, you know, a few... Uh, <laughs> communists and communist sympathetic uh, and anarcho-syndicalist uh, trade unionists, you know, got together <laughs> and uh, decided to, to try this wild and crazy thing uh, to 
unionize Starbucks and they got bought a, not bought, they didn't buy a house. Um, they set up, uh, you know, a fund to get a couple months rent off the ground. And then people were to get jobs at Starbucks, different Starbuckses uh, to then continue paying that rent, you know, sort of starter thing. And, um, and then grow the, grow the union that way. And that's why you had a bunch of simultaneous elections. It wasn't a spontaneous reaction, which people, a, a lot of commentary thought at the time, like, oh, this is a spontaneous reaction to this unrest that has happened in, um, you know, in the wake of the 2020 uprising and sort of following naturally out of, you know, this organizing we've seen over the last few years of, of the teacher strikes. And it's like, no, it was not spontaneous. It was planned. Um, and uh, and then I can tell you personally with the ALU salting, it, um, that's a mix of there was some, there was more of an interplay between um, spontaneity and, and people trying to foster the salting because, um, you know, the salting experiences, because these can play out in different ways. Um, and it's two examples that are interesting to look at side by side because they're happening at the same time, sort of unbeknownst to uh, everyone. <laughs> um, you know, uh, but uh, the Starbucks Workers United, you know, that was under um, the Workers United umbrella, which is underneath the SEIU, and there's some in interesting internal politics there. Um, but nonetheless, it was sort of by an organization that already existed, even if, you know, it's sort of complicated internal union politics, versus the ALU salts were. You know, I, I was part of another organization. I was part of the Young Communist League, um, which sort of is, was part of getting me to SALT, but um, no one else was in an organization. And they also, no one came to SALTing together. Like it was, that was a more interesting sort of um, somewhat spontaneous decision to SALT versus SALTs being sought out. So there is, again, this interplay of spontaneity and and organic things because both sets of these organizers were taking lessons from Foster, not knowing that the other set was also doing it. So how do these things happen? Um, you know, we should study Gramsci, I don't know, but uh, it there is a lot of um, methodical stuff that, that takes place. And I actually think that when you compare the, the, the trajectories of, um, you know, Star Wars United and ALU development, um, you know, both are progressing and there's all sorts of factors that, you know, uh, make it so they progress faster or slower. Um, there's different obstacles in each case. But at the same time, I think part of why Star Wars Workers United is progressing, um, you know, sort of faster in a more um, methodical organized way is because its start was more methodical and organized. And so you have the imprints of the thing that started it is always going to be there. Um, so yeah, but salting was part of part of all of it. And then just that bottom text is just a text that you can't read on the screen, but it's from uh, the Inside Organizer School from Chris Townsend, who was one of the organizers of the school that started it. He sent it, um, and there are some upstate Communist Party members there, like helping set up for the day, bringing in William Z. Foster text. And he's just like, the left must do the work. He's very sweet, old man. Um, and then, yeah, it's just a little bit more about the salting. Um, does someone want to uh, read this page? Do a whole page reading? Someone hasn't read yet? Oh, who raised their hand? I think you loaded it because I said who hasn't read, but you can go, Eric. Yeah, that's why I lowered my hand. Um, yeah, okay, if there's, no, if there's no one else. At least 10 undercover activists, including Westlake, landed jobs at Starbucks cafes in the Buffalo area, where they quietly laid the groundwork for the first successful organizing campaign among the company's U.S. employees in decades. That victory inspired hundreds more successful union votes at Starbucks and other companies. 
Early on, a group of six salts made up half the organizing committee for the Amazon Labor Union that won an election at an 8,000 person warehouse in the Staten Island borough of New York last spring. Field and Westlake lived in a group house with a couple more salts. That crew avoided hosting coworkers or even bringing home dates. Instead, some of them hung up pictures of Karl Marx and United Farm Workers co founder Dolores Huerta, and the group used flashcards to quiz each other on Starbucks recipes and compared notes with other salts on which co workers could be key to a successful union drive. Westlake chose Gianna Reeve, a charismatic and sardonic Buffalo native. At 20, Reeve was a shift leader who commanded, res <clears throat> excuse me, who commanded respect from baristas and bosses. She encouraged baristas to take bathroom breaks whenever they needed, and she wasn't shy about bad-mouthing corporate. In the summer of 2021, each salt broached the subject of organizing with the coworker, asking them to meet up outside of work. Reeve says she thought Westlake might be asking her out on a date, but she'd been reading about the industry's labor unrest on Reddit and wasn't shocked when the subject of unions came up. Westlake told her he'd heard about the movement from someone who'd helped organize his last coffee shop, asking if he wanted to be involved in a new union campaign. Reeve, whose dad was a United Auto Workers member, replied that she was all for the idea as long as it wouldn't get her fired. Westlake didn't tell her that he'd been dismissed from the first coffee chain where he led a union drive. He gave her tips on organizing more support, and she helped him figure out who else to ask. Other pairs at other cafes did the same, and by the end of August, Workers United had sent an open letter from 50 Buffalo area employees to the company CEO <clears throat> and began filing for union elections at several shops. Thank you. Um, yeah. Uh, yeah, and, and here I just highlighted some things that I thought were, you know, notable good practices. Um, I mean, the comparing notes on um, you know, as a collective comparing notes together, um, and also the sort of quizzing of the recipes also to be good workers, right? This idea of not only trying to trying to win a union, but you want to be a, a good worker there so you can keep your job and also so the other workers respect you. Um, yes, comrade, one second, let's get you a mic. Um, and I'm, I'm not saying this question to, to criticize uh, um, what's in Westlake for doing this, but just seeing if I'm seeing this correctly. Mm -hmm. um, Westlake didn't tell her that he'd been dismissed from the first coffee shop where he led a union drive. Isn't that a little bit contrary to the to the point from that uh, earlier slide about uh, not like downplaying the risks and not misleading? I mean, I understand practically the, the use of doing that, but it does seem a little contrary to what was on that last slide. Yeah, no, I mean, I, I, um, I may have been more honest, but, uh, you know, sometimes you do, it's not, you know, sometimes it's more like you know that you'll bring up the information later but you don't want to overwhelm in the moment you know um and then the comrade the comrade who's salted in the back has some some words some thoughts also it's like what was her name reeves isn't dumb like she knows she can get fired for unionizing she knows she can get fired the reason the question came up is because she knows it and so like by not acknowledge like i might have said yeah you can get fired but also maybe that wouldn't have been a good decision because like workers aren't dumb we know the risks but she did it anyway because she wanted it and so it's more about like not acknowledging that piece of fear there like mm -hmm. as long as i don't get fired like girl you know you, you could get fired but you're gonna do this anyway because the fear is less important than the work so right or I would say if I were to acknowledge it, it would definitely um, be in a way that doesn't lean in that doesn't lean into it. Um, because yeah, because it's like it's like you you also don't want to over you don't want to dwell on it because that'll, you know, create inaction. So it is, it's a it's a dance of uh, semantics. When to choosing when to say what. Do you think they're trying to make him seem more 
sneaky in the article about creating like West didn't tell her. This. Yeah, I mean the I mean Josh, who the the person who wrote this article is very fr- is very friendly to to labor and is a former trade unionizer and uh, trade union organizer and you know um, a lefty of sorts so but but sure i mean he's also writing a story so the article is like titled you know the undercover organizers behind amazon union win so he's trying to play up the sort of spy uh elements and intrigue you know that's that's there but he's also right there's a narrative there's a narrative thing um going on i i uh you know so yeah um but it is it's 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 i wouldn't even think it's lying because i don't think because it's not like she asked a question but it's just he chose not to dwell on it um and yeah like the comrade said um workers aren't workers aren't dumb they know (laughs) it's when you say oh you definitely won't get fired like he didn't do that don't do that that's what the lie would be the lie would be like yes you will not get fired if you do this that's you know or implying it by saying oh but that's illegal you know it's like it's like no you want to that that's where the lying is does that make sense where you sort of assuage the fear oh comrade yes i think you could also or like um i i helped organize a card drive last summer and i think one thing that we were taught to say if somebody expressed like fear about something which would be well the union was already in place so but to be like oh you know if through participating in the union and having a strong union, like we can protect each other um, from retaliation from the boss. And like, yeah. Cool. Yeah, no, exactly. Um, Right. And there is, and actually we're going to get into that. Some of the talking, some of the how to talk um, that again, this will be familiar to um, some of you, but even when it is, it's always good to, uh, so a quick thing, uh, I called this a mini workshop. We have a half hour left. It's like barely even that, um, real union organizing workshops, uh, you know, usually take place over a couple of days. They're many hours long, you know, there's sort of, it takes a lot of time. Traditionally, uh, there were whole schools devoted to this. There are still a few labor colleges, but like, uh, the, yeah, the point is that these things that I'm about to present uh do not i don't want to even you know imply that it qualifies training but um but they're educational so uh you should take them you should you should you know write them down internalize them rewatch this video and then take a real workshop (laughs) um so there are just a few to choose from so jane mcleary regularly does online uh workshops uh over zoom uh she just finished one um so i don't know when the next one will be but like you can email her check check out her website follow along um those are good there's the upstate new york inside organizer school i don't know when the next one will be the last one was the weekend of march 12 13 but i can find out so those of you who can make it up to the albany rochester region um and want to go to that uh if there's anyone watching online uh, or here in this room, you know, who lives in the South or it wants to make a move um, to South Carolina, uh, the uh, Union of Southern Service Workers, uh, you know, is actually working to do a targeted campaign of Columbia. Um, you know, they want to recruit union organizers to uh, do mass uh industrial service work organizing um you know and and anything basic you know it's like there's so many things that qualify as service work uh and it's because that's what runs our economy now so it's like they're really taking this you know industrial uh, approach which is really exciting um so those are a few specific ones and then different unions organizations and parties have labor conferences and, and trainings all the time so just be on the the lookout and like i said i can i can get you more specifics but um but yeah if you're interested in this stuff it's definitely good to take the trainings ask the questions do the role plays um do the worksheets think through it all 
Um, because even though it is true, as I said, that the real practice is in the doing, it is good to rehearse sometimes because you, you, um, you know, even though like, yes, if you make a mistake, you might lose someone and not be able to get them for the, the campaign and, and you've lost them and then you just have to move on. Like you don't want to dwell on it because you can always rebound. <sighs> But still, sometimes you say the wrong thing in the wrong moment, and then you did lose that person for the union campaign, and you had that moment where you could have gotten them, and then you didn't, and now you won't until the next time, right? So uh, so it, that's why it's good to practice, so you have this sort of like, uh, this rehearsal of things you can pull from in the moment. Um, but yeah, but all that being said, the real practice comes from the doing, the real learning comes from the doing and trying to apply these things in your workplace. Um, cause if you're just talking, it's nothing. Um, cool. So, uh, from the CIO to the UTLA. So, um, did folks in here, were folks in here following the big LA, uh, school district strike that happened? Uh, a few weeks ago, it was really exciting. It was really exciting. 60,000 people, um, education workers, teachers, staff support uh, went on strike and they won their demands. And um, it was, you know, they, they organized throughout the community, the families and community supported the strike, um, figuring out getting services and food for, for kids who needed on those days off and families came out in support. Um, you know, this strike uh, was very meticulously planned. Um, this is one of the organizers who worked on that campaign. She also comes from the SEIU CIO model tradition. Um, so, you know, she talks about methodology and the science of building structures of structure building in the union and how it's not random um, and how it's very planned. And then she lists some examples of structures that allowed for this success. Um, elected union leaders at every one of the schools where there's a strike, you know, so you have a cell captain, basically 300, more than 300 chapter action teams I'm not entirely sure what that is, but like we can all guess, right? It's like they're, they're teams that were sort of the, the chains to do the, the, the phone calling to reach out to everyone to get them to take actions. Uh, there were chapter meetings um, at all of these different, you know, schools and chapter action teams. Um, there was leadership uh, that that vote see this is voted to honor the strike right so the leadership followed the workers right versus a lot of times you'll see leaders try to unfortunately in in um you know bureaucratic centrist union uh you'll see leaders that try to quell strike activity um but those are just a few examples of of the structures um, that were built over years. So when you talk about structure testing and you talk about the terms that I'm about to throw at you, um, a lot of this is associated with Jane McAlevey. Uh, Jane will be the first to tell you though that they are not her methods. They are not her way. It was a way she was taught. Um, she's very proud of the mentors she had who were communists, she's very proud of the communist and CIO background. She's never never been in the party, but um, but she's knows the history. She appreciates the history. She appreciates the methods because they work and she teaches them to other people and then and then they they work, you know. Um, and and she's helped lead um, and organize um, you know, workers to organize not only massive strikes, but also like huge. Um, contract negotiation battles. So she has a number of really good books on all of this. Um, and she just, she wrote down these methods so they get associated with her, but they're, they are old um, and they're used all over the place. You know, they're actually not, you know, they're sort of, they're just what you do to, to win, to win, uh, especially in this country. Um, so Remember, everything is about power. It is about building power. 
There are no shortcuts to union victories. Uh, you, as an each individual organizer, will have to talk to, you'll have to have literally thousands of conversations, just you. And then a lot of people will have to have thousands of conversations. Um, maybe that doesn't mean thousands of individuals, but also like you'll find with organizing conversations, there's a lot of follow-up conversations. So like, it's not just like, you know, bim, bam, done, one and done. Um, unfortunately, it, that's why it takes a long time uh, to win demands, even a weak contract, uh, to move forward, to even get into negotiations. Um, you have to be able to strike and to strike in a way that will hinder production. Um, usually that means a majority strike. There are some instances where you can cleverly, if you know the production line, of wherever you work well enough, you could hinder capital without a majority, but it's a lot easier <laughs> to win the game actually. Of try you should try to build the majority, right? Um, because the point is that you have to inconvenience to, to even get them to the table. Um, and it's more true than ever with US conditions, like uh, just companies are just not honoring just not honoring contracts like left and right. And they don't feel like they have to. Um, and all of the major capitalists, um, you know, Bezos, the Waltons, Elon, uh, the folks that, you know, run all of the logistics sector. I mean, they're all saying like, you know, they don't, they're not gonna come to the table. They're not gonna create contracts. They're not gonna renew contracts, you know? So it's, uh, you, you, you need to be able to exert good old fashioned power even using the legal structures. Um, and then none of this happens spontaneously. None of this happens by accident. There is a science to it. And also it's gonna take a long time. It's gonna take a lot longer than you want it to. Uh, sorry about that. But just know that, you know, like you have to be ready uh, to like set in for, for the fight, you know. Especially if you go somewhere and you're like, I want to see through the contract. Like, even if you're doing it the most successful, like it's going to take a couple of years, right? And um, yeah. Uh, so as with any discipline, practice is necessary. Practice takes effort and it's painful. <laughs> Sometimes uh, mistakes will be made, but you have to keep going. Class war is real war. People die on the job every day and the bosses kill them and we're organizing them to fight back and save their own lives. So we have to take this seriously. Okay, so uh, some of these, you know, these uh, things on the right, structure tests, list building, structure organizing conversations, semantics, um, training, these are all classic, you know, labor organizing, training modules that you'll get at a lot of organizing schools, but particularly uh, with the 1199 method, um, you know, taken from the CIO days. Um, and then I've sort of broken it down. This is how I think of these things connected to each other, right? So, what you as an organizer need to make happen, right? You need to make, you need to um, carry out structure tests, right? So a strike, right, is the ultimate structure test. You know, you need to try to carry out projects, campaigns for the union to gain more ground, win new victories, bear their teeth, you know, show that they're still in fighting form, build uh, build itself, uh, create circumstance where workers are working together to 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 um, to do this. So so these methodological um, ways of winning victories and also knowing how strong the union is. This is called structure tests, structure testing. That is the sort of analytical term for that. Um, so, you know, you need to make structure tests happen. You know, you need to get collective action. Structure, 
Sure. Uh, uh, petitions. Um, everyone wearing a particular button or a shirt or um, taking surveys. Uh, anyone participating in any kind of collective action. So the structure test is the methodological tool for analyzing collective action, if that makes sense. But it's also a purposefully done collective. It'll make more sense as I go through the slides also, by the way, just so you know, but because um, they connect together, it helps because I'm talking a little abstract and then it'll get a little more concrete. I apologize. Um, but uh, yeah, the, but the thing that differentiates just like, why am I not saying a strike or a survey or, or whatever is because some of those things, they can be done more spontaneously or they can be done with less rigor um, where you're not necessarily trying to build a majority or not analyzing to try to reach new people you haven't talked to. It's just a little more random. And structure testing is a way of carrying out these collective actions purposefully. Um, so yeah, I hope that makes a little more sense and it will, I promise, make more sense as I go. Um, so how, so you want to you want to have structure tests, you want to test the structure and integrity of your organization. Well, how do you, how do you do that? How do you know what you have? So you have to create lists, you have to chart out the relationships in the workplace. Um, you have to ID people as, as leaders within their departments, um, these kinds of things or, or other kinds of designations that you want to be IDing for. How do you do that? How do you get people to um, do what you need, the, you know, build towards the structure tests. Uh, you have structured organizing conversations. These are different than just talking with someone. They're, they're sort of planned um, and they have goals. Uh, and then uh, throughout all of this, it's, uh, as you level up, uh, you get more particular with your language because you're, you're thinking about how the words are perceived. So structure tests, what are they? Um, I'm going to do sort of, we have, I'm going to rapid fire through these slides. So um, structure tests are a systematic way to test and strengthen the democracy and power of action within the union. So, um, and you know, really anything can be a structure test, but it's also you want to think through, like you could also think through it by going backwards, right? So if you think about, we want to strike, then you can think about, well, what needs to happen before we strike? What are the steps along the way that would lead to people feeling confident to strike? Um, you would need lower forms of collective action. And most workers do have a sense that collective action does um, most worker organizers like have this sense that it's good to build collective action, like escalate. Um, and that's true. Um, but structure testing is a way to examine those escalations and track everything. Um, this is still abstract, I know. Uh, but you just, you want to keep doing structure tests to keep testing the structure of, of the union. Um, and the main point is that you're, you're, you're tracking some data. So over here, um, so I can't really read this, but a great example of a majority structure test. In this case, a public majority structure test, that's this petition on the left, um, in the lead up to a unionization vote last week in Vermont, we were voting yes. And then on the right, the lopsidedly pro-union yes to unionize, 123 to yes, 32 no in the final vote count. So this was a public petition that um, organizers had, uh, organizers and lead worker organizers had other had workers sign saying that they were going to vote yes, and they said we are going to publicize this petition, but we're not going to do it until we get a majority. 
not going to do it to a good majority. And then they got that majority. And that is how they knew, like that is how they built the yes vote because they, you know, they were able to tell other people, look, we have all these other people signed. They're going to do it. It builds confidence that the rest of the workers are also going to vote yes. Um, there were a lot of workers talking to other workers. So it was building out different structures. This was also definitely collected by department um, over time. Uh, and yeah, and then that basically uh, lined up with what the vote was. So, and then the idea is there were a lot of structure tests before this as well with this campaign, I'm sure. I can't tell you what they were, but they, they were there, right? So they were doing these sort of similar like, um, you know, building for collective action and trying to, to build majority collective action. So this might make a little more sense if we talk about, uh, shoot. there we go. Oh yeah, we do structure tests um, because it's how we assess things. Um, the doing of structure tests forces collective work, helps teach workers how building the union works in real time. Um, and it, it, it's like, we can also tell where we're weak on things. And you'll see that with how we track the structure tests. So list building, charting. So union organizers still today, like they make these big charts and they put them on walls and you're tracking everyone on big charts on walls that take up the whole wall for the whole department. And, and it's like, We've had computers for a long time now, so it's not out of that kind of necessity, but it's because it is a uh, active tool that works in a way that stimulates, you know, it encourages collective people looking at it, it encourages collective people working on it. It, it there's something about the stimulation of physically writing that does a thing to the brain. Um, but you can see in this, you know, again, this chart of a unit of a nursing unit. These are all names. The highlighting, uh, you know, some names are crossed out because they no longer work there. Uh, but the highlighting, you know, indicates probably that they signed a union card. All of these other dots indicate something else. So, you know, signing a union card, that's one form of structure testing. Um, you know, completing a survey for uh, demands, you know, um, signing a petition participating in a march on the boss, going to a rally, um, coming to a, you know, it's like anything can be a structure test, but the point is, is are you systematically doing it in a way that you're not only tracking it, but also using it to try to build and bring in other people? Um, so also I can send out these slides to people if you want, cause I know there's like lots of stuff written on them. Be good to, to, to look at, I'm sure, you know, I'm sure you want to, um, but yeah. And you chart systematically, you chart by department, you find leaders within those departments to do the charting, which brings to, oh, leaders, tracking leaders versus activists. So, um, there are leaders in workplaces, in departments, you know, it's not necessarily even the shift manager or whatever, but the person in the department that other people listen to. So comrade earlier brought up an example of friend groups. That's one way of thinking about leadership structure. Like who's the leader in that collective? If you get them, you can get a lot of other people, but also maybe you don't want to try to go after that person first right away, because maybe you don't have the relationship with them to flip them and you don't want to get on their bad side. Cause then, because they run that little collective, then they'll get all those other people to be against you. So you need to think through strategically who you want to approach within that collective to get the leader of the collective. So then you get everyone and the leader helps then get other people. So this process is called IDing, identification, right? And you, you track this on your lists, on your charts, um, you know, the organizers, uh, you know. And I know it might seem like, it doesn't seem really invasive to this. It's like, no, you don't understand. The bosses are doing this. The bosses know who the leaders are and the bosses target those leaders to be on their side, you know? Um, so 
they're already doing this sort of systematic approach and it's what we need to do as well. And then, you know, as you talk with people, they'll give you ideas of who to talk to. You can recruit them to talk to other people, these kinds of things. Um, this is a worksheet that I'd done. It's all my scribbling on, a, on it. it was like a, a worksheet on identifying organic leaders and sort of I was given a, a word problem to think through. Uh, so um, I can also give you stuff like that if you want it. So how do you talk to people? Structured organizing conversations. This is different than just chatting. Um, there's a purpose to it. Uh, it's not just a social call. Uh, you know, you're trying to collect information and then you're trying to get the worker you're talking to to do something. The ask will vary. Um, it might be to join the, you know, join the organizing committee. It might be to sign a union card. It might be to come to a meeting. It might be to, um, you know, find other people in their department. Whatever it is, you know, you'll you'll have an ask, um, and then you also always have a follow up plan because follow up is a lot of organizing. Uh, it's good to use a structure because it gives you a, a map for staying focused um so like any conversation you start you, you say who you are i know that sounds obvious but sometimes um you know just saying people forget to just say hello you know a sort of hello uh but yeah and you find out what you you say while you're there to talk about the union you find out the issues that the other person has you agitate around those issues by asking them questions about them. You explain why the union is the answer to the problem. Uh, and then you ask them to do something. You inoculate so you tell them, um, you know, something to expect. Like I talked about how you inoculate against, um, how we inoculated against union busters, right? By talking about how you might see this or, uh, and then and then you, you know, give a work assignment and you follow up or they're like not interested in that moment and you back off and you follow up <laughs> later. Uh, you know, you're like, okay, cool. Can I ask you again? Cause I will. Um, so, you know, handling objections. I apologize for this, like a pirate thing, but they really, it's really, you know, our AAR, that's the, that's the structure for handling objections. Um, acknowledge and affirm, uh, answer the question they asked or the query or, or, or concern, and then redirect to get them talking. And I know this is abstract, uh, but this is why you need to go to the class because that's where you really practice applying this stuff. Um, listen more than you talk, ask questions, don't lecture, channels pe channel people's anger. It's like all those principles that we've talked about. But, um, but yeah, really find ways to let people talk. Um, and then just as you get better at this, right, you do start to think more about the semantics of what you're saying. Um, because the words we use affect how people respond. You know, you don't want a third party, the union. You don't want to talk about the union like it's a different entity from the workers. You want to empower the workers to understand that they themselves are the agent of change and that they are necessary to creating that change. Um, and you want to find ways of centering that. And you want to encourage workers taking responsibility for their own liberation. And that's basically what the semantics comes down to theoretically, uh, but there's some practical stuff. And again, I can send these slides around uh, if, for people um, who want them. And then also remember when you're talking to the workers, because with these conversations, you're mostly trying to talk to people who aren't on your side yet. So people already on your side, you don't need to, you don't need to talk to the choir. You're talking to people who, who like aren't in the union yet. So they don't know you. So coming in and talking about the revolution, probably not the way to go. Um, you know, 99% of the time. I mean, there's like, 
so and and if it is that person will tell you they'll say something you know that'll, that'll you know um, but you want to be getting down to the brass tacks of their problem in the workplace and how unionization is ultimately uh, the way to solve it or participation in the union or striking or whatever the collective action is um, that is necessary at the time. So uh, sorry we had to rush through that. Um, but the good news is that next class, there's so much time for discussion. So I did that on purpose. Um, next class, there's going to be a little bit of history of just the last few years um, since 2020 of the renewed revolutionary union movement. But then I want to take the time to have us all talk together, um, help answer questions um, from our own experience and what we've learned and how we want to apply it to our own organizing. Um, because as I've said, we're all trying to answer a lot of these questions together. Um, so yeah, uh, we're gonna close out with one more song. Uh, so just one final note on union culture. Um, yeah, culture builds community, breaking bread together, um, making art together. These things are important. Um, they've been a part of every revolutionary and union movement from the beginning of time. Uh, and um, just you want to make sure to keep that culture going. And it's, it's a big part of how you build the union um, and how you build the revolution. So this song, uh, this final song that we're going to play um, is, uh, yes. Um, so this final song that we're going to play, just don't play it because I want to say what it is. Um, so uh, is Union Train uh from union train to common um which is a, an old um union song based on a uh um you know uh black church uh song the old train of zion and so the original union song it's very it's very it's like so it's very pretty it's that it's that union train coming. It's that union train coming. It's that union train coming. Get on board. Get on board. So it's really beautiful. Uh, thank you. It's a really beautiful um, old union song. And I introduced some of these songs to my ALU comrades during the union drive. And one of my ALU comrades is this fantastic um, comrade, Tristan Lyon, uh, Dutchin, um, right there. Uh, he was fired during the union drive, but he still organizes with ALU. Um, and he's also a musician and a songwriter. And uh, he took those lyrics and he saw them and he was like, oh, I want to update these with a reggae beat because that's what he likes to do. And uh, that's one way that that socialist music and that labor music has passed down through the generations is the lyrics stay the same and the melody changes. And so it's just like a good modern update for that. So you'll get that and then a snippet of another song. And um, yeah, I'll see you next week. Uh, thank you so much, comments. Coming. No, rewind from the top. Pull it up, selector. Let's go. What's that I see on the comment? Comment. What's that I see on the comment? What's that I see on the comment? Comment. Get on board. Get on board. Is that the union train not coming? Coming. Union train not coming. Is that the union train not coming? Coming. Get on board. Get on board. It has saved many a thousand. Thousand. It has saved many a thousand. It has saved many a thousand. Thousand. Get on board. Get on board, it will carry us to freedom, freedom, it will carry us to freedom, it will carry us to freedom, freedom, get on board, 
get on board. Dun 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 dun, dun 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 dun. The Beatles. When I say A L, y'all say you. A L U, A L U. When I say A L, you say you. Mm mm mm. Now this one. System I try for bring me down to a lower level. Amazon Corporation is nothing special. Treating the workers like slaves, that is the work of the devil. Never again in your life, mediocre, not settle. In a Staten Island where also is built like prison. Jeff Bezos and his henchmen will never sit back, listen. Every day they make their money off of the workers' real thing. It's time to come together, expose the propaganda that's in. You better now run. The ALU come. We don't carry knives or guns. What do we really want? A strong union. When do we want it? Now, now, not soon. Billionaires, they gotta go. Billionaires, they gotta go. Billionaires, they gotta go. Amazon should know this is our street. This is our street. This is our streets, more fire, real heat. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, fuck twelve. I said one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, fuck twelve.